Welcome to this week's edition of Outdoors Online, a weekly webcast produced by the North Dakota Game and Fish Department. I'm your host, Tom Jensen. My guest this week is Stan Cohn. Stan is an Upland Game Bird Supervisor with Game and Fish. We're going to talk about pheasants. Uh, Stan, you and your crews are completing your crowing count surveys, I guess. First of all, let's uh, explain what a crowing count is. Well, it's a breeding bird index, Tom, and of course we all know rooster pheasants crow and on the average they crow about once every two minutes and on a nice calm day an observer can hear a rooster crow approximately one mile. So with that information we have over the years set up uh, transects, 20 mile transects throughout the state and we have our observers stop every two miles so they get 10 stops within this 20 mile transect. Essentially they get out and they listen for the number of pheasants uh, that they hear crowing and uh, of course the crows are an uh, indication to the hens that uh, you know a male's there that this is a place they can come in and get bread and go off and nest so uh, pheasants crows from early May till June and that's when our survey period is and you're right so we just finished up our survey and uh, with these uh, growing count uh, call numbers that we get it gives us an index to the breeding male population out there and we can assign you know the number of females to that to get some kind of uh, index to what our spring breeding population is and that's kind of where we are right now. So this is an adult bird study yes survey. yes this is this is a, a, a pre-production uh, adult uh, uh, population survey that we do every spring we've been doing it for 40 years and so we do have some long trend information on uh, an annual basis what these uh, crow counts are, are showing for us and, and so we can make some comparisons from year to year and over a long-term average so this doesn't necessarily give you an indication of what bird numbers are going to be like uh, th this fall. How do you find out that information? Well, that'll come later this summer, Tom, when we start our production surveys. And then that's just not for pheasants, but we also take a look at uh, grouse, uh, huns, and turkeys at the same time. And uh, we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about that more later on, but essentially what that'll do is give us some idea of the number of hens that have had broods, uh, the number of chicks in the brood, and that'll give us some index as to what our fall population is going to be based on the number of chicks that will be entering that fall population. So yeah, right now we're just counting adults to see what our breeding population is and that next step will occur later this summer. Right. You mentioned that um, you split the state up into different transects and things like that. Um, now that gives you a better handle on geographic changes across the state too, I would suppose. In that, populations. You're, you're right, Tom. What, what we ended up doing was uh, breaking the state down into four pheasant districts and this was based on topography, uh, habitat, uh, some weather conditions so that uh, we've had essentially what it fell into is kind of like a northeast segment and a southeast segment, northwest and southwest. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then not only do we get a statewide average both on crowing counts and production, but we also can break it down into these four pheasant districts. And that kind of helps sportsmen a little bit too to get some idea of which area is going to be a little better for them to pursue birds in the fall. I would guess now if you've been on the same transect for the same number of years and uh, the loss of CRP is what I'm driving at, I guess I get, and I would think that that would have a a bearing on uh, the number of birds that you're finding. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, I guess production on any of our wildlife species is not really rocket science, and especially not in upland game birds. Uh, habitat and weather drive the population. And over a length of time, if you run one of these uh, spring breeding bird transects for pheasants, what you end up seeing are changes on the landscape, but you also notice what, how the weather's affecting them during that time period and what it's going to be like as those hens enter the breeding season, you know. And uh, if we have, uh, you know, good weather and some good grassland uh, habitat on the landscape, then we're probably going to produce some birds. You're right, uh, back in the mid-2000s, we had, uh, you know, close to 3.4 million acres of grassland habitat on the landscape through the Conservation Reserve Program. And since those mid-2000 years, you know, slowly CRP has been removed. And uh, unfortunately, some of those acres have been removed in some of our better pheasant range. And of course, that does make an effect on population uh, estimates throughout the, the time period because of hens can't find those safe areas to nest and to brood their young, uh, chances are we're not going to be producing as many down the road. 
To hear people talk in the hallways here at Game and Fish, it seems like everyone's talking about the number of birds that they're seeing on the landscape, that they're finding lots and lots of birds. Have you had a chance to crunch your numbers yet and maybe have some preliminary? We have, Tom, and just to back up a little bit, that's a, that's a good perspective that uh, I've been hearing the same thing, not only from landowners, but from our own field staff, that they have been seeing a lot of roosters this spring. And, and a lot of it had to do back to the spring of 2014. Uh, even though our habitat conditions out there were, were good, but the number of acres of grasslands, not like it was back in the mid 2000s, but weather was in our favor. We had a really nice spring last year and the hens did quite well, not only for pheasants, but for all our upland game species. Production was quite good. And we noticed that again in the fall when we took a look at our age ratio of our harvest, the number of young that were showing up in the harvest was quite high, higher than it had been the last couple of years. So we knew we had a good, per, good production year in, in 2014. Then we carry that through the winter and uh, winter wasn't too bad last year. We had our normal spikes of some cold weather and a little snow, but all in all, pretty nice, nice winter. And so our, our adult hen pheasants from last year came through the winter in pretty good shape, as did the roosters. And of course, the roosters are what people were picking up on, not only in the southwest, but even in areas in the southeast and up in the northwest part of the state. So going into our crowing count uh, survey, we had a pretty good feeling that we were going to see some increases in the number of roosters we heard calling, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, uh, as the numbers were coming in and, and we started doing the summary, it looks like our uh, spring crowing count uh, numbers have increased from last year anywhere from 2 to about 12 percent in our major uh, pheasant range and, and actually from about 10 percent to 12 percent south of the interstate which is generally some of our better uh, pheasant areas. So going into the nesting period our adult population looks pretty good. This may be a little off topic Stan but now it seems like the last several weeks we've had thunderstorm after thunderstorm after thunderstorm torrential rains in some of them. Do you think that these recent heavy rains are going to have an effect on the pheasant populations and the broods that are starting to hit the ground right now? A couple, a couple things kind of happened to us this spring, Tom. Uh, May was kind of cold, if you remember, and we had some cold nights and, and some folks were asking me, well, you know, what's this going to do? to the pheasant population. But at that time, our hens hadn't really started nesting yet and those that had were uh, incubating pretty tight. And, and I think that period came through without any trouble. And then we entered into uh, late May and June and you're absolutely right, the weather was probably more typical of what we get in the spring here in North Dakota with a lot of variable weather coming through, unstable air. Uh, we get these rolling thunderstorms coming through where in localized areas they can get some hail, they get uh, you know a couple inches of rain, and uh, then it moves through. And so I, I guess because of these quick moving thunderstorms where you do get a lot of rain, intense rain in a short amount of time, uh, depending on where those hens are nesting, you know, you may or may not lose some hens there, but you always hope it's early enough in the, in the nesting season that those hens will go off and re-nest. And so you lose a little bit, but you still got that hen sitting on eggs at some point in time. So we may or may not see it. Uh, it's, a, it's a little early yet, I guess, to make that call. But if a guy was going to ask for a gut feeling, I would say, you know, probably didn't hurt us too bad at all. Uh, those hens are pretty tough and they'll, they'll hold it real tight on those nests and they'll do the very best they can with those young chicks to try to keep them dry. And I guess the other thing we had going for us is the temperature during this June period stayed up there in the evenings. We didn't have hardly any nights where the temperature went below 40 degrees. That's a positive. So wet can be, can be dried off with young chicks, just like when you're raising chickens. Wet and cold is a terrible combination for a young chick. So right now I would say we're probably okay but we'll know a lot more in the end of August. Stan, thanks. You're welcome. Upland seasons in North Dakota are not that far away. Sharp tail and roughed grouse and partridge seasons open Saturday, September 12th and remain open until Sunday, January 2nd. Then the pheasant season opens for residents and non-residents on Saturday, October 10th and stays open until January 2nd. Make sure you have the proper licenses for each season and familiarize yourself with the rules, regulations, and limits, both daily and possession, for all upland game species. For Stan Cohn and the rest of the staff here at North Dakota Game and Fish, thanks for joining us for Outdoors Online. We'll see you again next week.